All right, welcome back to the program. Nimish Patel is here. Hey -o. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Boy, great to meet me. you. Nice to meet you guys as well. Dude, I tell you what, just uh, I, I was watching a whole bunch of your stand up yesterday. Uh, your resume is, it's unbelievable. Thank I you. Mean, you've done it all. What else is there to do? What <laughs> else is there to do, Nemish? The garden. <laughs> the garden. You haven't done the garden with Chris Rock yet? Uh, no, I did not. I was there when you did Hulu Theater. I was just sitting in the back, but uh, I've yet to perform at the garden. And I felt like I could have done it this year. I just, because I have two shows at Town Hall, which uh -huh. hold, I think, like 1,700 each venue and the, the Hulu theater is like 2,500 or 3,000. Wow. So, but I didn't know I was going to sell out the first town hall. So when oh, the second you. one popped, I was like, Shh, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> but well, next year. Well, I just want to say you are at the, uh, at Helium Comedy Club this weekend. Yes, sir. Um, you got uh, your 7.30 shows tonight and tomorrow sold out. So still 10 o'clock tickets left. Yes. Um, I mean, your story is unbelievable. So, so your parents are immigrants yes. from, from India. Yep. You moved to Parsippany. I was born and raised in Jersey, but uh, my parents were parents landed in Newark, and then they spent like two days there before they got robbed. And they were like, All right, "We got to go somewhere. We won't get robbed." Moved to Parsippany, uh, and I was born and raised in, in in Jersey, right there. But yeah, and they, and they hard workers open up a liquor store. Yes, my dad had a liquor store. He worked at a liquor store since he was like seventeen. And I I don't know how old he was when he finally bought into one. But yeah, it was in his twenties, probably. So the real question is, how disappointed are they in you? <laughs> that, I mean, it, it, it's uh, it's hard. It's hard to say. It's hard to say because uh, I'm doing all right, you know. No, you're doing all right yeah, now. Yeah. You're doing all right now. But but you know, look, Liam, you went to NYU, which is, which is a great school. Did you get good grades? In high school, in yes. High school, yeah. In first two years of college, I did fairly well. But last two years, uh, uh. I didn't become an investment banker. So. <laughs> did you, did you, do you think, like, and this is kind of what happened to me. Like, my first two years in college, I was all in it. Yeah. And then that third year, I went, this isn't going to really do it for me. I, I don't know what it was. You know, I wish there was, like, a moment where I was yeah. like, what am I doing? But there wasn't. It was, like, kind of just like a general malaise that, well, that, that washed over me at some yeah. point. Well, and, I know for, for immigrant parents, uh -huh. and my wife's parents are immigrants, came here in the 70s from, from Soviet Union. Uh -huh. uh, you know, of course, they moved to this country for better opportunities for for themselves and for their their family for more food than potatoes more food than potatoes so when when son comes and says mom dad i'm gonna be a comedian well it wasn't it was more like uh get a job and then do whatever you want because i was like after i graduated from nyu i wasn't working uh i was like i graduated in 08 so it was a typical year Oh yeah, for, uh, for the people. Financial crash. Yeah, for people with finance degrees to do anything <laughs> that if if they were like <laughs> mid students at, in college, and so I was like living at home for like a year and change, and I was like really bored, and I was like, what am I gonna do? And I tried this corny writing class, and it was corny. Uh, uh, and then and I was like, what am I good at, and what do I like doing? Like like making people laugh. I had no stage fright. I like I was listening to a lot of comedy at the time. No like, stage fright. None whatsoever. So your first stand up uh -huh. gig. Uh huh. I mean, you just went up there and like, F it, I'm just going to do it. Yeah, it was, I, I have stage fright in the sense, like, I don't know if a joke's going to work. That's going to be really bad. But none of like, oh, my, there's so many people looking at me. Like, I right. never, I have no problem with that. It's like, I've always been fine with that. Uh -huh. It's more like, are these jokes going to work? If that's stage fright, then yes. But none of like, there's so many eyeballs up here. Like, oh, I can't make eye contact. Like, I never had any yeah, problem yeah. with that. Um, and so once I started that, it was like, oh, nine, August, um, I had no, again, like, all the stuff I've done in comedy, I never really had a plan for it. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I'm not a planner. In this. I'm a planner now, but back then, I'm not, I wasn't like, well, I'm going to do stand-up for, like, three years, and then I'm going to get a writing job. And then the, the, yeah, the, when uh, you're in your 20s, things just happen. Yeah, it just kind of happened. Just, I was on day stage. Day by day. Exactly. And, the, like, even day by, like, the only thing I remember thinking when I got off stage that first night was, like, that was fun. I'm going to do this again. And then I did it again, like, two nights later at this club in uh, New York. The now, it's now New York Comedy Club in, in East Village, but it was then Eastville Comedy Club. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got on stage there, and the first shop, first spot I ever did was New Brunswick Stress Factory mm -hmm. in New Jersey. And it was, like, 120 people. It's like, a, a bringer show, which means you got to bring people so you can get stage time. This show at Eastville two days later was not a bringer show. It was just an open mic. It was, like, four people in there, like, yeah. other comics. And I was like... And I bombed because it was just like 
four comics and I thought I was going to crush like I did mm -hmm. at Stress Factory. And uh, it was not that. And that made me think, man, I could do this. Like, you know, I don't care what you guys think. And so, like, it was always that balance of I'm good at it versus I'm going to prove myself at yeah. it. And that kind of just kept going. And then my parents were like, what are you doing? Are you making money doing this? I was did, like, you, did you move back home? After graduating. After graduating? Yeah, yeah. I, I moved out and have a job. And so I couldn't pay rent. So I was just mm -hmm. living at my parents' place. Luckily, it was 40 minutes outside of the city, and there's a bus, like, right yeah, yeah. down the street. So I would take their money, spend it on a bus ticket, and then spend their money on a Metro card, and then spend their money at uh, open mic, because uh -huh. a lot of those mics you got to pay to get on stage. And, and that that drain on their finances like, what do you, you need a job like get a job and then i was like bounce around doing internships and all this stuff being underemployed yeah yeah and uh luckily you know i had a friend who gave me an internship that then turned into a real job at another place and once i got that job i moved back to the city about a year and a half later and then i was like i was still severely underemployed for my finance degree but mm -hmm. I was making enough to pay rent to live in, like, a living room. Yeah, to, and, to take care of your comedy addiction. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> luckily, it was a, I mean, I could, that could have gone a lot of different yeah. ways, yeah. you know. Like, I got, luckily, I didn't try, like, crack that first, <laughs> that <for> August, <laughs> August 19th. You know, it could have been anything. Yeah. yeah. It could have been any vice. It just so happened I got very lucky that what I was going on with my head and my heart, I didn't turn to alcohol or anything like that. I turned to the drug that is stand-up mm -hmm. and, uh... Here I am, 13 years so later. So when, when, that, when that started rolling mm -hmm. and you started doing a couple more shows and all that, did you have, because you said you, you weren't a planner, you didn't really plan it, mm -hmm. but did you have like a goal like, oh, man, I could turn this into SNL or no, a movie it, star? Or the, none of those things. Like, I was never like, you know, you hear these stories like, I was six years old, man. That's when I knew I wanted to do stand-up. Right, right, yeah. right, right, right. I didn't know I wanted to do stand-up until about like, six years ago you know what i mean like <laughs> wow okay I, I, i'm saying exaggerating but it was more like i didn't have any idea of where it could go what could happen think i just allowed things to happen and took advantage of opportunities that were given yeah, to me so we'll see what happens yeah. and i also had you know cool. my closest friend in comedy and one of the closest friends in his life is michael J, like the head anchor at snl and and a lot of our peers like the lucas bros kevin barnett like all these guys were doing amazing things and they're my close friends i'm like my friends are doing amazing things. It's only a matter of time before I get those same opportunities. I get to do that kind of stuff as well because I see my peers, my my brothers I talk to every day mm -hmm, doing yeah. the same thing. And so that always kept me going, you know, like, mm -hmm. oh, he did it, I'm going to do it. Like, I, I like, Che got a, a, a Letterman, like, three years into comedy or four years into comedy, and I was like, everyone was like, that's crazy. I'm like, it's not that crazy. He's hilarious. If I'm just as funny, we could all be all be doing this. Yeah. Is it is it and, and being a comic in New York is one of those things where you never know who's in the crowd. Right. So is that what happened to you? Because I know Chris Rock was in a crowd. That was that was so you know, comedy at that point. This is 2015 in New York. I don't know what the the that that middle stage of comedy is like right now in New York. But when I was coming up. Everyone, and still to this day, like, it's very important to create your own stage time. And in 2000... Hustling. In Hustling, you got to find a bar or a place, that, a venue that will allow you to come in and be like, let, let us try to stand up at your, at your venue. And we luckily found a spot in, like, 2011 called Bar Matchless. Um, this guy, Mike Denny, who is now, like, was, was, was myself, Mike Denny, and Michael Che, who are, like, the three hosts and producers of the show. But Denny found this spot... Then he's now like a producer for West Side Gun and, and Benny the Butcher, and so he's crushing it. But um, he found this venue in 2011. Fast forward 2015, this is like one of the best shows in New York. Che is like on this meteoric rise, so like the shows are packed. Mm -hmm. It was like the show to do. One of the shows, it was like probably two or three shows to do, and this mm -hmm. was one of them, Broken Comedy. And uh, our friend Langston Kerman was supposed to go up. Langston Kerman, now a uh, uh, head writer for HBO shows and crushing it. But he was supposed to go up uh, so that Chris Rock could come see him because they wanted to attach Chris to a pilot that Langston was working on. So Chris Rock was there to see that guy. Yes. Wow. And uh, Chris was late, and so Langston couldn't go up. And then I got word Chris was coming, and I was like, Chris is coming? And, and then as I'm, as I'm like, waiting by the door to see what's going to happen, Denny's on stage, Chris walks into the room, and then— So he missed his set. 
No, he didn't miss. Langston didn't go. Langston no. didn't go up until we didn't let Langston go up. Okay, we didn't put Langston up until Chris was going to be there. So yeah. But then once Chris walks in, I'm immediately like, this is the guy I started a comedy for. Like this is I I know like two specials by heart is Bring the Pain Bigger and Blacker. Yeah, yeah. Chris Rock is right here. I'm going to perform. And it's like a hot crowd. Like Kevin McCaffrey had, had set the tone and. Uh, uh, so a hot crowd is like they are into it. They are into it, and that show, Broken Comedy, if you ask people, is notorious for not being hot. Like, it would be packed, and people would just stare at you. Like, so of all the nights to come, Chris Rock uh, yeah, is there on a hot yeah, crowd a night. hot crowd night. The stars yes. are the line. At a, at a show that you and your buddies built up. Yes. Like, like wow. created and built. Exactly. It just felt very serendipitous, and yeah. I was like, Langston, I'm going. <laughs> and, you know, Chris <laughs> is going to stay for you, so I'm going to go up before you because it's – it's Chris Rock. So I went up and I had like one of these blackout sets. I hear Chris laugh when no one else. Chris was Chris laughed at one joke that no one else laughed at. <laughs> Did you know where he was in the room? I knew exactly where he was. <laughs> uh, and I tried to avoid, I tried to avoid. I, it's a very, it's not a big room. It's a small, it's sm it holds like at most uh, seated, probably like 50, 60 people. Uh, we would wow. have like 120 people in there because we could open it up to the outside. But it would, it would be packed yeah and, but there's like only one area i still remember i know exactly like there's one area by the bar that you could stand and watch it and be kind of low-key right by the door so you could exit quickly if you needed to like chris needed to and uh i told a joke this is right when cecil the lion had been uh quote unquote murdered oh, yeah. <laughs> by a dentist and uh i remember just thinking in the bathroom right before i went up like what can i say about this dumb lion and it just always hit me as odd that we cared about animals the way that we did. Like, we ruined this dentist's life mm -hmm. <laughs> because he, you know, told the truth about his vacation. <laughs> and, and I just remember thinking, why do we care about lions? I had four chickens today. And, like, maybe it's like a chuckle or two. <laughs> but Chris died. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you guys don't know what you're talking about. This is hilarious. Yeah. And then I just, like, I kind of, like, blacked out. Like Ron Burgundy and Anchorman, I just went kind of crazy. What happened? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and then I got off stage. I like, I, was, I said, I looked at Chris. And then I left the room. He watched Langston. I'm still standing there, like right outside of the bar. Uh, Chris comes out. I was like, "Hey, man, you're really funny." And I was like, "You're Chris Rock." <laughs> and it, <laughs> I was like, "Thank you." <laughs> and he left. And then like three. Four weeks later, I got an email saying Chris wants you to write for the Oscars. Wow. And I was like, Just like that. that. It was like, what? <laughs> You're crazy. And then, and then I didn't believe it because it was from the producer that had come to see Langston, who was yeah. friends with Chris. And then, like, Chris got the. Uh, it was announced that Chris got the writing or the hosting job for the Oscars, the 2016 Oscars. And uh, and then, like, a few weeks after that. My manager got a phone call from some old dude, and then she called me, and she's like, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, what? She's like, Chris Rock wants you to write for the Oscars. So I was like, and she's like, you have to go, like, next week to meet him. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Sent me the contract, and that was it. That was, like, November 2015. Like, July, 25th, July August 2015 is when Chris saw me. November 2015, I think he got the, the – it was announced that he got the job, the hosting job. Uh, November 2015, December 2015, we're like writing Whoa. in New York. So just like that. Just like that. When that happens, so do you go, oh, this is it for me, I made it. That's 100% what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> my, thought, my thought would be, oh my God, what do I do next? Yes, it was, It was. well, those three months from November to uh, end of January, like beginning of January was like, we're just writing movies. I'm like, okay, like writing jokes about movies. I'm in my in my apartment with my wife, like, illegally downloading every movie that's going to be nominated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I was watching, like, three movies a day, just, like, writing. They didn't send you screeners or anything? No, I mean, there's no time, you know? Oh, wow. And I wasn't in the guild or anything at that point. Yeah. It was just, like, find wow. these movies and write the jokes. Go, go watch them or something. And so I was just downloading and watching all these movies. And then the nominations come out, and it's like, that's the year there's no black nominees. And so it's like, all right, well, all these jokes are on fire. Like, yeah, none yeah. of this means anything. Now Chris is just going to do whatever Chris does. And then, you know, obviously the Oscars happen and uh, it's a fantastic show. And the, literally, you know, I'm thinking this whole time, like, I told all you that didn't give me opportunities. <laughs> I told all you. I did all this out of spite. Yeah, you know, I told, I, told, I told you Montreal JFL, you didn't want me to do new faces three years in a row. Chris Rock just told me I was funny. Who do you think you are? That's how I felt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah. this was the Oscars 2016? 2016. 2016. Not, I, Riz, not, I remember you saying how good the writing that was. That was the best. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was a fantastic. Who are these writers? It was a fantastic <laughs> show. And uh, uh, Do you remember hearing one of your jokes on TV? 
I the joke I had given him got cut. Where he cut it. I got, none of. I don't think. I think one or two of my jokes might have made it. It was one where it was acting's not brave. Um, dr- brave is drinking a glass of Kool Aid in Flint, Michigan. Like that was. <laughs> that was a. That was a joke. During the water crisis. Yeah, yeah. yeah during yeah, the water crisis. Kind of time he, he. I told him drinking water in Flint, Michigan, but he he gave it his Chris Rock. Right. He's, he's like, you got to be specific. Is Kool Aid? I'm like, that's you're right. That's a much better right. joke. Yeah. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Chris. You're Rock. right, yeah. Mr. Rock. Yes. You're right. <laughs> oh, of course. Uh, and and so like after the Oscars, I was thinking, man, all right, here comes fame and fortune. Here, comes, here, we, here we go, baby. Uh, money's already spent. Uh, the checks are on their way. So like you know, like I told all you comedy people, you don't know who you messing with. That's. The governor's ball is right at the Oscars. You know, I'm like hanging out with Dave, and like Dave is where I hug Dave, and you know, everyone's drunk and having Dave a good Chappelle? Dave Chappelle, Chappelle, yeah, 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 yeah Dave, Dave Coulier. Coulier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was there. <laughs> uh, and, you know, like Sarah Silverman and, and Louis C.K., all these people, like, and there's people dancing on the dance floor with the Oscars. I'm like, Aaron Rodgers there with Olivia, Munn. like, it was a great time. The next day, I'm like, all right, waiting, looking at my phone, and I'm like, okay, nothing's happening. And I'm eating dollar pizza outside of the comedy store, uh, waiting to hopefully get on their open mic. You know, like yeah, that's back to reality. Back to reality, you know. Mm-hmm. So to answer your question in a very long way, it's like, you know, I thought a lot of things were going to happen that didn't. I thought like, oh, this is it. I thought I made it. And part of my heart, even now looking back, I did make it right then and there. You know, it's like Chris Hawk was telling me I was funny. Like I don't. Well, but also now you got put. You get to put on your resume. <laughs> exactly. Which leads into Saturday Night Live. No, it wasn't. It wasn't like that. It was. It was still just like grinding, working. You know, I was once nothing really materialized after uh, the Oscars. You realize that. I mean, you maybe don't realize is that like, sure, you got the Oscars gig, but you still got to be prepared with like a spec script and all this kind of mm-hmm. stuff. That's like that if you want to write on a TV show. And sure, like that that little line in your resume might open a door or two, but there's still a lot of work behind it. And I wasn't necessarily ready for that work at that time because I, I didn't get any jobs after that. I got a, a Hassan Minaj hired me to write for the Congressional Correspondence Dinner, which mm-hmm. was a year before the White House Correspondence Dinner. But you know, I didn't get like a crazy new gig right after that. I yeah. thought I was going to go back into the world. I was working in finance. Um, and I thought I was going to maybe I could use that. Oscars gig to turn into like a, a copywriting gig or something, yeah. you know, but that Oscars didn't open any doors at any advertising agency. You still need a portfolio and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, all right, what do I do? What am I going to do? I got to go back into finance. I collected a little unemployment, unemployment. I got that job at Hudson. I got passed at the cellar, uh, in June of 2016. And I think that was probably the biggest thing that I got from, the Oscars. What does from, that mean? What does so, that mean? So the comedy, the comedy cellar. cellar is like, you know, the marquee club yeah, yeah. in New York That's City. That's where, remember, I went there and I saw Dave Attell. Yeah, he sure. was on the show two weeks prior and didn't remember who I was. <laughs> he walked up and said, hey, Dave, what's up? And, hey, how are you? Uh, that, that sounds crushed. pretty Dave. No, yeah. He's still crushed. Was, yeah. Well, here was what happened. I mean, so Dave Attell on the show. And, huh. Dude, we had a great time. Did yeah. we not have oh, a great yes. awesome. time? As good a time as we're having uh, right now. Off yeah. the air. Off Please the remember us in two weeks. Dave comes around the corner. The two of them are looking up old school New York things. And I think Dave might have braided his hair. And like, it was. <laughs> and, and what, my, I was in New York with my brother-in-law uh-huh. and, and his wife and friends. We went to the Comedy Cellar. Uh-huh. David Tell played. He's standing outside smoking one of his American spirits yeah. out by the stairs. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I go, hey, I know him. So I walk over. He had no idea. Uh, oh, that's, not, that's classic Dave. That's that's very. I mean, I don't think Dave knew who I was. I, I wanted. I stepped into the street and wanted a cab dip. <laughs> okay, but that's that's you got a classic Dave yeah. story, man. Oh, we got another Dave story too. Please. And we off the air. We had told you like, hey, here are some things to check out. Uh, Dave went and checked out the gentlemen's clubs on the <laughs> east side, <laughs> and they went into the club and they had a great time. He was there with somebody from the club, literally picked him up from the airport, and they went out. Uh-huh. Dave's suitcase and everything still in the car. They go to the gentlemen's club. They go out and watch his car being stolen. Oh, <laughs> all of Dave's stuff in the luggage. trunk. Oh, that you know, really stinks. Really, what's in his luggage? A couple black hoodies, yeah, and probably. a couple carton of cigarettes, empty iced coffee cups. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's got one iced coffee cup. I, I, I don't know if you guys know this. It's just one the same. Thing. 
classic cup he's had for three thousand years. It's a trench coat and a uh, and a black and a black hoodie. And that's it. Yep, and uh, like a bunch of hats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, what were we talking? Oh, oh, so oh you got past past I got passed at the cellar. So what do you mean past at the cellar? I don't so know you got to audition to 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 work at the comedy cell. You got to like perform in front of the booker to get gotcha. there. And I think because I had gotten the Oscars gig and I think a few comedians knew that I had gotten it directly because of Chris, like saying I was funny. Yeah. One of my friends, I don't, know, I don't know if she'd want me to mention her who vouched for me, so I, I won't, but shout out to, if you're listening, if you hear this, like, I thank you very much. She was like, Esty, you should, Esty's the booker at the cell. She's like, you should see this guy. I sent my tape in. I auditioned. I got passed. And I think that was the direct result of, um, the Oscars thing, but because of that, because getting passed at the cellar, like when they pass you at the cellar, at least in the in the very beginning, like you get to work a lot. Like they want to make sure you're good, you get your legs uh, at working at the cellar. So I was working a lot and not making a ton of money or anything. It's not like paying rent or anything, but I was I was like chipping away at rent and like side gigs here and there that helping me out. A couple with unemployment, like I was paying rent and like eating a little bit. <laughs> and, and then and then I got a a writing job because of Matchless, because of the broken comedy show I used to run uh, to write for Aquafina. Uh, uh, she had a, she had the show called um, Talk with Aquafina on, on the Go Ninety Network, which was like a Verizon thing. And that was like that. Once I got that gig, that was like a month and a half. Once I got that, and that didn't pay anything, but enough to again cover rent and eat. Once I got that, I was like, all right, I'm not doing finance anymore. I'm not looking for a job. I'm gonna oh, just man. I'm gonna just ride this comedy thing out. Um, and see what happens. And you know, I got you know, rent, like I got a, a I, my friend and I, we sold a show to MTV Two, like a pilot, which was like you know two dollars, but it was enough. To be like, oh shit, I got something. Mm -hmm. Sorry to curse. And then, um, uh, uh, what's it called? And then I got like uh, I, I was working on the show Vidiots, MTV Vidiots, mm -hmm. which like aired in South Africa, which was mind blowing because I went to South Africa for work. You're a god there. And, and they I got statues. <laughs> they got statues. Too. And I saw myself. Vidiot. Uh, no, my cousin went. My cousin went to South Africa and was watching TV. He's like, "You're on TV here." I'm like, "That's insane." I'm on TV in South Africa. <laughs> um, and then you know, I was getting random gigs like that, working at the cellar and, and, and doing a lot of shows at the cellar and helping pay rent and all this stuff. 2017, mid 2017 comes around. I get a writing job on this sketch show called uh, Francesca, like Francesca Ramsey sketch show, a pilot, and it's like six people, eight people in the writers' room. Uh, uh, and working, working, it's like a month and a half long gig. And then, you know, Che and I have been talking over the summer, like we talk all the time, but we were just doing some work together. And then randomly, you know, uh, I get a text from Che, he's like, congrats. Like, oh, he's, he's telling me, he's like, I'm going to put you up to write for the show. For Saturday, yeah. Michael yeah, Che from Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Right. And uh, uh, I was like, okay, cool. Let me know what happens. And then, you know, I'm, it's like September, like, was maybe, what was it, five years ago, almost to the day, but five years ago, like a week ago, I got a text from Che saying, hey, congrats, idiot, you now work for SNL. I was like, what? Wow. <laughs> wow. Just like that. Just like that. Like, you know, like, he put me in, and it was, like, he was, you know, I think him and Colin had been a year or so into um, being update anchors. Mm-hmm. And, like, uh, uh, he wanted to bring someone on to help write for him. So you were writing specifically for Update? Yeah, I was writing specifically wow. for Update. Um, when you go into something like that, too, like a writer's room, because you, you hear all these SNL stories. I picture a stories. lot of donuts. Yeah, you, you hear all these <laughs> SNL stories about different eras and, like, the stress level and this and that. Uh -huh. And, and uh, being somebody that you said doesn't have any stage fright, do uh -huh. you go in, like, with fun, like like this is going to be fun, or this is going to be stressful. Is well, a writer's I, room like that a stress ball? Or? It was it was a mix. It was mixed. I had a mixed set of emotions in that in that room because the update room is a bunch of vets. Like there's there is like uh, you know Josh Patton, uh, uh, Katie Rich, um, uh, uh, and a few others, and I was like the new kid in town, and I'd come not off of. Like, not everyone knew anything about, no one knew anything about me. I was yeah. like, this is Chase friend. And so I had that kind of half, like, oh, this is super exciting. Like, let me write jokes. But also, like, also, like, man, I, these guys are killers. They know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I don't write jokes like, this happened in the news. Here's a punchline. Like, that's not my style of comedy at all. I thought I was just there to, like, kind of uh, help Che with, with his voice. Because I know it relatively well. And so it was a mixed bag of emotion there yeah. uh, when I was in the room. And I did feel pressure to deliver. Um, 
but you know, once once you get, it's it's a hard place to like find your footing because you gotta find it like immediately, it's like mm-hmm. straight out the frying pan into the fire kind of situation. And it took me a second, and uh, uh, it ended up being a lot of fun. Yeah, and you were there for you were there for a year. I was there for a year, a season, and uh, it was a tough season, but it was it was fun. I had a good time. It was a year that that's a year that I decided I'd never want to think about politics ever again. Yeah, I can I, imagine. I hated like I remember at one point. While I was at the show, I like deleted my Twitter account. I was like, I can't, I can't even, I can't look at Twitter. I can't look at this anymore. It's too much. Mm-hmm. And, and it was a year that was like the Stormy Daniel year of uh, Trump's yeah, presidency. Yeah, yeah. You know, like every day was another thing. I was like, what? Who? Stop caring. Enough. Like, yeah, it was enough. Enough. I get it. You get yeah. burnt down really easily. So for sure, for sure. All right, Nimish Patel is at Helium Comedy Club uh, tonight, 10 o'clock, tomorrow, 10 o'clock. Uh, the 7.30 shows for both nights are sold out. Yes, sir. I know you got a YouTube thing. That's out now. It's uh-huh. called Thank You, China. I do. It's a, it's a special that I shot. You know, I went into, you know, I've been touring for basically almost like a two years straight now, uh, a year and a half uh, to two. It would be two years straight when I'm done uh, in April of next year. And last year when I started touring, like March 2021, I had no dates on my calendar. Mm-hmm. April, May 2021, I was booked for the year. And it was just because, you know, TikTok, I don't know if you follow me on TikTok, but that's how I made my uh, uh, stand-up career take off in terms of getting tickets and all that kind mm-hmm. of sold. Um, and so, like, when I started in April 21, I kind of set out with, like, all right, this is my mindset. I need to have an hour by the end of the year. Like, I have, I've been waiting for this moment to headline and tour yeah. everywhere. Now I've got... A billion dates, I got to have something to deliver. So then I had all this loose collection of jokes, and I was like, how do I shape this into a special? Because I've watched three, four specials in my whole life, like fully. Maybe five, Elephant in the Room, For What It's Worth, Killing Him Softly, Bigger and Blacker, Bring, bring the Pain. Like, those are the five specials Damn. I can say. I've seen the entirety of them. Otherwise, like, I don't really watch a lot of comedy. And so I was like, I need to make something that I think – can it, it won't come close to any of those specials but i want something in that vein like i need an hour that people will be like oh this is how an hour stand-up should be my friend mookie was like maybe you should write it like a movie would be structured mookie thompson who opens for me from time to time he was like you should maybe frame it as a movie and i was like okay well i got some jokes some things that have happened to me how do i make this a special crafted it over over you know those eight months turned it into a special that shot self-produced finance in uh, December of, of 2021 and it was uh, a labor of love it was a lot of work but I like well, what I like what we got it's out there for a minute to watch thank, thank you thank you China it's on YouTube yeah. uh, Nimish Patel do appreciate you coming in thank you very much good luck with everything and the next time you come back I want to talk about the thing that happened at Columbia with you and for sure I mean, there's so much st- God there's so much stuff to talk about I've, I've got a lot going on there he is <laughs> Nimish Patel everybody <laughs> see him at Helium